Adventures in Negro History. America has truly been blessed with bountiful resources stretching from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Today, America is blessed with great industrial and agricultural developments, which provide its citizens a standard of living unequal by any other nation in the world. But how did this come to be? Was it by miracle or some sudden streak of luck? The obvious answer is no. America is a world leader because of the contributions and sacrifices made by Americans since the beginning of our glorious history. And who were these people who endeavored to build America? Well, they were all kinds of people, rich, poor, adventurous, and brave, and all races and nationalities, Italians, Englishmen, Mexicans, Germans, Poles, Indians, Chinese, Norwegians, Frenchmen, Japanese, Russians, Spaniards, and many, many more. Truly, a melting pot of humanity. But what of the Negro's role and contributions in American history? The Negro's role in the history of America? A good question. Perhaps we can briefly try to answer this for you. Let us turn back the pages of history and start from the very beginning. Let us consider the era when the New World was first being explored by European nations. Let us not forget that it took tremendous courage to venture into new and uncharted lands. Pedro Alonso Nino, a Negro, was a pilot for one of the brave ships which sailed on and on to fame and glory with Christopher Columbus. And there were many other exploration parties. And among these adventurous men were many Negroes. Yes, there were many of us. We came to the New World with the conquistadors and explorers of the 16th century. 30 of us were with Balboa on that glorious day in 1513 when the Pacific Ocean was discovered. What an awesome sight it was to gaze upon the mighty waters of the largest ocean in the world. The first wheat crop was planted and harvested in the New World by a Negro who traveled to Mexico with Cortez. We were with Pizarro during his conquest of Peru. We traveled into the interior of North America with Alarcon and Coronado. We were with Cabaza de Baca in the exploration of the southwestern parts of America. And as early as 1565, under the direction of Admiral Menendez, Negro workers helped build the city of St. Augustine, Florida. We were a part of an important movement in the history of the world. Perhaps the most significant Negro in this era of history was a tall, muscular man named Estevanico, or Little Stephen. Speak, Estevanico. Tell us of your contribution. I, Estevanico, was chosen to lead an expedition party in 1539. We left Mexico City in search of new territories and especially to find the fabled seven cities of Cibola, which were supposed to be heavily laden with gold and silver. Our expedition traveled on and on through the Indian wilderness, searching, ever searching, for the seven cities of Cibola. And even though we never found the treasure, we were the first to explore the territories now known as Arizona and New Mexico. Negroes also traveled with the French expeditions in Canada and along the Missouri Valley. Yes, men of color, some free Africans, some born in European countries, explored with the Portuguese, Spanish, French, and English, and certainly contributed to the opening of the New World. As the European nations strove to carve out bright new tomorrows in this new world, it became quite evident that the surest way to guarantee success would be to exploit the resources of this virgin land. This called for extensive cultivation and exportation of staple crops to Europe. But how could this be done without a large and economical working force? What sources could be tapped to gather such a force? Several solutions were tried. Indians were forced to work for the ruling colonists. 
This proved to be unsatisfactory because the Indians would either escape into the forests or sicken and die. A system of using indentured servants was also tried. Poverty-stricken and landless Europeans, along with some who were in difficulty with the law, were brought to America during the first half of the 17th century to cultivate crops and clear the forests. These people voluntarily allowed themselves to be bound for a certain period of years to gain complete independence in their new homeland. My name is Anthony. I am an African. I was on the first ship that brought native Africans into the colonies to be sold. We docked at Jamestown, Virginia in 1619. They call me Isabella. I arrived on the same ship with Anthony. I later married Anthony and bore the first Negro child in English America. I am Pedro. I too was on that ship. There was a total of 20 Africans aboard. We arrived in the New World tired, fearful, and bewildered. We found this new land strange, but not as harsh as we had thought it would be. It could have been worse. Ah, yes. We could have been sent to the West Indies, where slavery was truly a cruel fate. But instead, we were made indentured servants. This gave us the opportunity to work for planters a certain number of years, and then we were on our own. During the early part of the 17th century, Negroes in the new colonies of America were given much the same opportunities as other early settlers or indentured servants. Some even acquired land and servants. However, the worldwide demand for cotton and tobacco caused planters to look for an increased labor force, a cheap labor force. It was at this point that Africans began to be considered as good slave material. What could be cheaper than slave labor? And there were available slave sources in the West Indies and Africa. During the 1660s, the colonies began to write laws making Negroes slaves for life. The die was cast. The full importation of Negro slaves began. Captain Ball was a Yankee slave. Blow, blow, blow the man down. He traded in Negroes and loved to save. Give me some time to blow the man down. Captain Ball was a Yankee slave. Brought from the interior to the west coast of Africa, the slaves were packed in the holes of slave ships and sent to the distant shores of the American colonies. Sold to the slave traders by both Africans and Europeans, the slaves left their homeland with saddened hearts, fearful of what tomorrow might bring. Slave trading became a most profitable business, and the Negro population in the colonies grew by leaps and bounds. By 1860, there were four million Negroes in America. Some slaves gained their freedom, other Negroes were born free, but most Negroes were held in bondage. The time, the middle period of the 18th century in colonial America. 1765, the Stamp Act is passed by the British Parliament. 1770, a prelude to revolution, the Boston Massacre. On March 5th of 1770, an incident occurred which sparked the first incendiary fire which soon blazed into the Revolutionary War. Crispus Attucks, an escaped slave and a leader of the Boston Patriots encouraged his companions to resist the British Redcoats, saying, The way to get rid of these soldiers is to attack the main guard! Strike the root! The British soldiers fired into the crowd of Patriots, and Crispus Attucks, a Negro, was the first to lose his life in the Boston Massacre. Crispus Attucks, the escaped slave who loved liberty more than his own life, has been acclaimed the first American to give his life in the cause of freedom. A monument still stands on the Boston Commons in honor 
of Crispus Attucks. They called me Peter Saylor. I was with the Patriots at the Battle of Bunker Hill on June 17, 1775. I helped my valiant comrades repulse the British Redcoats. We were proud to fight for the cause of independence. 5,000 Negroes contributed their patriotism and military valor to the American cause during the Revolutionary War. Many distinguished themselves far beyond the call of duty. I am Salem Poor. I too fought at the Battle of Bunker Hill. I was commended by 14 officers for bravery on the field of battle. On the Christmas night of 1776, I, Prince Whipple, was in the same boat that carried General Washington across the icy Delaware River. It was cold, bitter cold. But we took a thousand prisoners and won an important battle. Negroes fought with the colonists throughout the Revolutionary War. It was not an easy war. There was much suffering and dying. But victory was finally won, and the colonies became independent, free to rule themselves. Let us consider the contributions of several colored persons during the colonial period. Significant contributions to the American way of life. One of the finest writers of poetry during this period was a woman named Phyllis Wheatley, who became internationally known. She was brought to this country as a tiny slave and was taught to read and write by the kind family of her master. She once wrote, Soon as the sun forsook the eastern main, the pealing thunder shook the heavenly plain. Majestic grandeur from the zephyr's wing exhales the incense of the blooming spring. Soft pearl the streams, the birds renew their notes, and through the air their mingled music floats. Another Negro, Paul Cuff, distinguished himself in the field of commerce and became a well-known philanthropist in Massachusetts. He constantly tried to better the conditions of Negroes in America. And there was Jupiter Hammond, a splendid poet. Prince Hall, a veteran of the Revolutionary War and founder of the Negro Masonic Lodge, which bears his name today. And we must mention Benjamin Banneker, a genius in many respects. Benjamin Banneker, mathematician, astronomer, writer of almanacs, and a member of the commission that designed and planned the streets of Washington, D.C. America passed into the 19th century, reaching for a better way of life. Negroes also forged ahead, forming strong churches, attending special schools, and establishing mutual interest groups. These organizations made considerable effort to share in the general development of the country and to contribute to its growth. But there were many people in the United States who thought that slavery was an unfair institution. The Quakers, who actually formed the first anti-slavery organization in 1775, were joined by groups in every state from Massachusetts to Virginia shortly after the Revolutionary War. Leaders such as Noah Webster, Benjamin Franklin, and John Jay spoke out against slavery. Then came the active abolitionists. This organization contained such men as John B. Russworm, the first Negro college graduate, Henry Highland Garnett, a minister and editor who was called the Thomas Paine of the abolitionist movement and James Fortin, a wealthy industrialist who generously gave his money to the cause. The famed William Lloyd Garrison published a paper called The Liberator, which spoke out against slavery in no uncertain terms. But let us briefly point out three Negroes who were greatly involved in the anti-slavery movement. Listen, 
We're going to leave tomorrow night. Going to follow the North Star. Bring along a few vittles and the clothes that you'll wear. And remember, there's no turning back. Go down, Moses. Way down in Egypt land. Tell old Pharaoh that my people go. I am Harriet Tubman sometimes called Moses by the Negroes I helped to escape on the Underground Railroad. For like the Bible, Moses, I entered my Egypt to set my people free. As a conductor of the Underground Railroad, I led 300 Negroes from the plantations and farms through swamps and woods and across lakes and rivers to freedom in the North. And I never lost a passenger. I talks to God, and God talks to me. Now I hear them talking about the Constitution and the rights of men. I come up and take hold to this Constitution. It looks mighty big, and I feels for my rights. But there ain't any there. Then I says, God, what ails this Constitution? When I was born, they called me Isabella. But the Lord God done gave me a name with some meaning, Sojourner Truth. And I did become a soldier. I traveled in many directions in America, staying in any one place only for a brief time. And then I traveled on, always speaking out for God's truth. I spoke to all kinds of people about freedom for the slaves, the rights of women, and later on, equal opportunities for all people. I consider myself a messenger of the law. I expose slavery in this country because to expose it is to kill it. Slavery is one of those monsters of darkness to whom the light of truth is death. Expose slavery, and it dies. This speech was delivered in 1846, in England before an anti-slavery society. Abolitionists' activity forced me to temporarily flee the United States, for if I stayed, I would have been returned to bondage a condition I had endured for the first 21 years of my life. After returning to the United States with enough money to purchase my freedom, I started a paper called The North Star, which allowed me to print my thoughts concerning American life and slavery. I dedicated my life to the betterment of my people and my country. Later, I became an advisor to President Lincoln, I was also appointed as the United States Commissioner to Santo Domingo, the minister to Haiti, and held other high posts with the government. My name, Frederick Douglass. The Civil War began on April the 12th, 1861. Lincoln's earlier words of prophecy, a house divided against itself cannot stand, proved true. Extreme conflicts between the industrial North and the agricultural South, abolitionists and slave owners, those who wish to extend the region of slavery and those who wish to arrest its extension, these conflicts and many more raced past the point of reason, and Americans fought Americans. Many Northerners felt that the war would soon be over, 
They were sure that the Northern troops would quickly overcome the Army of the South. Northern soldiers marched to war full of confidence. However, the armies of the Confederacy fought relentlessly, and Northern armies suffered several crucial defeats. By the summer of 1862, the Union was in dire need of added manpower to put down the rebellion of the South. Midsummer 1862, here are the words of Lincoln. Things had gone from bad to worse until I felt we had reached the end of our rope on the plan of operation we had been pursuing. That we had about played our last card and must change our tactics or lose the game. I now determined upon the adoption of the emancipation policy. In September of 1862, Lincoln informed the South that he would issue a proclamation which would free all slaves found in areas which were in rebellion against the United States. The proclamation was to be rendered on January 1st, 1863. On January 1st of 1863, the day of promise arrived. And then, Lincoln's proclamation. That on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. Negroes and whites sympathetic to the anti-slavery cause rejoiced throughout the land. It was a day of jubilee. But there was still a war going on. A part of Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation appealed to Negroes to join the Union forces. For the first time since the beginning of the Civil War, Negroes were allowed to legally participate with the Northern Army. A number of Negroes had been fighting with the Confederate forces since the beginning of the war. We listen to the words of Lincoln, and we listen to the words of Frederick Douglass. Go quickly and help fill up the 1st Regiment of the North. Let us win for ourselves the gratitude of our country and the best blessings of our posterity through all time. We joined the Union forces, and we fought, and we died. Over 100,000 Negroes fought with the Union Army in such celebrated battles as Milliken's Bend, the Battle of Petersburg, the Second Battle of Bull Run, the Battle of Chapin's Farm, and many others. They fought valiantly. 21 Negro soldiers and sailors won the Congressional Medal of Honor for their bravery during the Civil War, distinguished herself as a scout and nurse for the Union Army, and was later awarded a lifetime pension for her courageous work. And then the war was finally over, 1865. The nation picked itself up and slowly tried to piece America back together by licking its wounds and trying to forget the bloody four-year war. As America began its reconstruction, the ex-slave, now a freedman in a land of peace, looked around and tried to find his place in society. He listened to the words of Thaddeus Stevens, United States Congressman and friend of the freedmen. Gentlemen, we speak of the problems of the freedmen. I say, give the freedmen 40 acres and a mule. These are the types of solutions that we have to reach in the he world He listened today and thought that this would be a good idea now that he was free and on his own. For the most part, uneducated and unskilled, he found it difficult to be a contributing part of American life. 
In time, he received assistance from several sources. Education was one of the most effective means of aiding the freedmen. Missionary teachers began their constructive educational work with Negroes in the South even before the war was over. The Freedmen's Bureau, established in 1865, proved to be a most significant organization. Not only did it establish day schools, night schools, and industrial schools, but it also established hospitals for Negroes and poverty-stricken whites, and also gave them rations. Many other religious and civic organizations did much to educate the Negro in basic and higher learning. Education was the key that opened many doors for the freedmen. Soon many educational institutions, such as Shaw, Morehouse, Morgan, Clark, Lincoln, Fisk, Talladega, Howard, and others appeared and grew. I, Charles Sumner, Senator of Massachusetts, say, give the freedman a ballot and treat him like a man. And for a while the freedman was given the ballot and participated in politics. Negroes such as B.K. Bruce, James Lewis, and Hiram Revels were elected to the United States Senate. Many Negroes, including the brilliant Robert Brown Elliott and Robert Smalls, were elected to the House of Representatives in Washington. Negroes were elected to the Constitutional Conventions, state legislatures, and other public offices. The durable politician, P.B.S. Pinchback, was elected as Lieutenant Governor, and even served for a short time as Acting Governor of Louisiana. Many of these Negroes who held public office were well educated, and devoted their talents to performing creative services for their state governments. Booker, honey, I know you want to get all the education that you can, but that school in Virginia is so far away. Yes, it was a long way from Malden, West Virginia to Hampton, Virginia, but young Booker T. Washington hungered for learning, the kind of learning that a school such as Hampton Institute could give an ambitious young colored boy born during the last years of slavery. And so at the age of 15, Booker T. Washington set out over the mountains to reach his chosen goal, Hampton Institute, some 500 miles away. After graduating from Hampton with honors in 1875, Booker Taliaferro Washington imbued with the idea that he could best contribute to his country and his people through teaching, began a long and illustrious career as an educator. In 1881, he created an institution of higher learning which still stands as a living memorial to his greatness, Tuskegee Institute in Tuskegee, Alabama. Later, he became an important diplomat and a spokesman for his people. Cast down your bucket where you are. Cast it down in making friends in every manly way of the people of all races by whom we are surrounded. Cast it down in agriculture, mechanics, in commerce, in domestic service, and the professions. While Booker T. Washington was busily engaged in building Tuskegee Institute, a tall, thin Negro was finishing his graduate work for a master's degree at Iowa State College. This man, George Washington Carver, would soon contribute his genius to Tuskegee and to United States agriculture as well. When I was invited by Booker T. Washington to join his staff as a teacher and director of agricultural research, I was intrigued by the problems of this growing school. I went to Tuskegee to help my people and remained there all my life. While at Tuskegee, George Washington Carver lowered his experimental bucket in the Alabama soil and extracted wondrous things. His work with a peanut and sweet potato yielded unheard of products, such as ink, cooking oils, peanut butter, metal polish, 
rope, rubber compounds, starch, and many, many more commodities that could economically be used by man. In 1953, the United States government purchased the farm where George Washington Carver was born and dedicated it as a shrine to his lasting memory, a fitting tribute to a man who rose from slavery to a great science. noise, Miss Lucy. Put that music book away. What's the use to keep on trying? You can't start no notes of flying if you practice till you're gray. Like the ones that rants and rings from the kitchen to the big woods when Melinda sings. This poem, When Melinda Sings, was written by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who was sometimes called the Robert Burns of Negro poetry. For like the poet Burns, Dunbar sometimes tried to capture the soul of his people through dialect. Born in Dayton, Ohio in 1872, Dunbar began to write poetry at an early age. By the turn of the 20th century, he had become an internationally known writer of poetry, books, and plays. He received worldwide acclaim for his contributions to American literature. The first 20 years of the 20th century found the American Negro making significant contributions to his country and himself. 1905, a group of Negro intellectuals led by W.E.B. Du Bois and William Monroe Trotter organized the Niagara Movement, which was a forerunner of many Negro interest groups. 1909, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People was founded. It was also the year that Matthew Henson, a Negro, and Admiral Robert Perry became the first men to reach the North Pole. 1910, the National Urban League was organized in New York City. 1913, in commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, the gifted poet James Weldon Johnson wrote, just 50 years a winter's day as runs the history of a race. Yet, as we now look o'er the way, how distant seems our starting place. Following the First World War, in which several all-Negro regiments were awarded the Croix de Guerre, creativity appeared everywhere. Jazz came into full flower following the pattern set by the immortal W.C. Handy. The poets, County Cullen, Claude McKay, and Langston Hughes voiced the sorrows, hopes, and aspirations of the Negro people. A. Philip Randolph formed the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. And as the years rushed by, America grew and so did the Negro. Bert Williams, Florence Mills, Ethel Waters, and Bill Bojangles Robinson became idols of the stage. Marian Anderson, Paul Robeson, and Roland Hayes thrilled audiences around the world and were considered to be among the finest of America's artists. Jesse Owens led America to victory in the Olympic Games. A young fighter named Joe Lewis became a symbol of American strength. Robert S. Abbott and Robert L. Vann were recognized as leaders in the newspaper publishing field. Mary McLeod Bethune became an advisor to President Roosevelt. And when the Second World War occurred, Dr. Charles Drew pioneered in the development of blood plasma. An Air Force pilot named Benjamin Davis Jr. led an all-Negro fighter squadron to paths of glory. And Negroes were found in every branch of military service and took part in practically every major campaign. And when the war was over, America returned once more to peaceful living and progress. A former Army lieutenant named Jackie Robinson made history by becoming the first Negro in Major League Baseball. <laughs> and what a player he was. And let us not forget an American whose contributions to his country and the world have earned for him the greatest respect of all his fellow men, Dr. Ralph Bunch. This talented, tireless advocate of world peace received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1950. 
for his diplomatic efforts in negotiating an armistice between the Arabs and the Jews in troubled Palestine. Truly a great American and a great humanitarian. Yes, the Negro has contributed much to the United States of America in the exploration of uncharted land, in military valor, in the arts, in sports, in business, in industry, in education, and in all the other areas of endeavor that have made our country what it is today.